Good afternoon from the MDB's pavilion at COP28 Dubai. My name is Giampiero Nacci. We have panelists coming as we speak. <laughs> Please, myself. Um, I'm a director in the Climate Strategy and Delivery Department at the European Bank for Construction and Development. And I'm really pleased to welcome you all on this panel. Uh, the aim to discuss investing in food system with the private sector to address climate change. So the agri-food sector represents one third of global emissions and is also, you know, has a res direct responsibility in, uh, in uh, the uh, uh, nature crisis, you know, in terms of impact on uh, um, soil health, in terms of uh, 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 impact on the marine ecosystem, but also in terms of biodiversity loss. At the same time, it's also directly exposed to the effects of climate change. You know, we see increasingly uh, how food value chains, food systems are exposed uh, by disruptions linked to uh, uh, climate, climate events. At the same time, in 2022, only 4% of global finance, climate finance, has flown into the food system. So there is a big discrepancy between the uh, uh, impact the sector has, but also the amount of finance that comes in to address the problem. We're talking today about the role of the private sector in addressing this poly crisis and how private actors can play a role in improving, enhancing the sustainability food system and offering solutions to all these crises the world is facing. We're going to particularly focus on the role of the private sector. We often uh, uh, um, forget that actually the entire food system are built on the private sector. It's not only the large corporations that we have in the room today, but it's also the SMEs. It's also the small older farmers. And also actors that sometimes we neglect, for example, the hospitality industry that can play a big role in, in terms of addressing the issue of food waste at the end of the value chain. So I'm really pleased to have a, a great panel with us today. Uh, I start from uh, my immediate uh, right, Marcia Barnou is a senior uh, uh, officer in natural resources and senior natural resources officer at FAO. Joe Puri, my associate uh, vice president, uh, strategy and knowledge at IFAD. We have um, uh, Arnu uh, Vandenberg, CEO of Aldisra. And last but not least, my colleague and dear friend, uh, Natalia Zhukova, Head of Agribusiness at DBRD. So uh, let's start with, uh, with a question for you all. Uh, that I'd like to really get a bit your personal experience with sustainability. So when I talk about sustainability, what comes to your mind? You know, how you interpret this word in your personal life, but also how it influences your work in your organization. Maybe Marcel, we start from you. Okay, thanks for that interesting question. And nice to see uh, fellow panelists, um, Joe and Natalia, and so very nice to be uh, on that panel. For me, if you say sustainability, I have the reflex to think uh, Agenda 2030 on sustainable development goals. So this is my uh, my reflex on that with the three pillars that you have. So uh, and you know all of them, so economic, uh, social, and environmental. Uh, myself, I, I work more on the environmental pillar. So we are here in the Climate Change Convention that really is about uh, the environment of our planet and what we can do. And, but we see the clear connection. You cannot address the environment alone without, as you mentioned, finance. You need finance. You need investment because what we want, we want transformation. And to transform something, you cannot do like that. So you need finance, investment, and people, because if you do not engage with the people, we will fail. So this is basically, in a snapshot, the perhaps two UN response, but I guess this is still one of the best uh, we can have. So, Thank you, Martha. Very institutional answer. Joe, <laughs> what about your personal experience? So for me, um, sustainable, can you hear me? Yeah. So for me, I think sustainability is the chasm that lies between innovation on one side and scale on the other. And why I'm saying that is um, every time we think about sustainability of any investment, you're thinking of different aspects of sustainability. And sustainability is a many splendid thing. Right? You can think about operational sustainability, 
financial sustainability and the sustainability of impact and operation sustainability yeah do you have the you know the operation unit on the ground to essentially take it through do you have the financial sustainability is there going to be resources above and beyond the grants that you've given and then sustainability of impacts becomes essentially ensuring that these are not just one off and i think for anything to go from just a twinkle in our eyes which is like an innovation and we know many innovations out there not all of them deserve to go to scale so what distinguishes an innovation from something that goes to scale has to be sustainability in these different aspects thank you this is really interesting because you bring different elements to the table here i know yeah, sustainability to me is about being future proof. Um, I'm not sure if you can hear me, but uh, great. Um, and I'm, an, I'm a true optimist by nature. Uh, I believe in human progress and uh, in the future we've, we've solved so many things already that what the challenges are ahead, I believe we can, we can solve them if we are sustainable. Um, we're an agricultural company, Aldara. Uh, we see our biggest contribution to sustainability in the fact that we will need to feed another uh, 2 billion extra additional people in the world. That's 25% more mouths to feed between now and, and uh, 2050. And from agriculture, I believe we can do that by improving our yields with that 25% or more uh, and, and do that sustainably. And I believe that's uh, sustainability to, to me and also uh, the company that I represent. Looking at the future. Very good. Natalia. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much. Um, you asked about personal experiences. It's, to me personally, it's about small intentional choices we all make. I don't know, reducing plastic, opting for public transport. I have a garden, for example, and I, um, I don't know, collect rainwater, is put up small bee hotel for solitary bees, you know, add mulch, for example, to apple trees. Speaking about the bank as an organization, it's also about certain choices of people, for example, minimizing or eliminating printing, again, reducing pl uh, plastic. But for in a bigger picture for the bank, I think for us, what we are really trying to, to promote is acceleration of adoption of sustainability practices by our clients. And I think this is what it means for me. Thank you very much, Natalia. We've been just joined by Darcy Vetter. Um, you are the uh, Senior Vice President for um, uh, Public Policy and Government Affairs at PepsiCo. So I just uh, we just started with a bit of a personal reflection, right? So we'd like to hear from you. When you hear the word sustainability, you know, what, what comes to your mind, what you feel, what you think about? I'd like to, to uh, hear about your personal experience and how this impacts your work. Sure. Um, when I think about sustainability, and especially in food and ag, um, to me, the word like nourishment comes to mind, right? We should be nourishing the earth. We need to be nourishing our bodies and our communities. And um, when I think about uh, sustainability, it really goes back to my childhood. So I grew up on one of the oldest organic farms in the United States. So my dad converted to organic in 1975. And so as I grew up and helped work on the farm, you know, he talked very deliberately about, you know, the choices he was making and that the soil was our most important crop. And he made very deliberate choices about hiring people in the community and buying our inputs from the community and making sure we were nourishing those around us. And so when I think of sustainability, I think about it in that way. You know, we had, um, we invited the Nature Conservancy and the Wildlife Department to do counts of birds and species on our farm and saw that as an important part of our farm's health. So um, I guess for me, it's like part of the ethic right, that I was sort of taught to uphold. But um, again, that that nourishment world of, you know, yourself, your community um, and the natural world around you, um, if you're doing it right, that happens. Thank you very much, Darcy. I'm really pleased about your answer because they give really a tapestry of what sustainability means for us you know we went from the very institutional <laughs> martial reflection on innovations and uh, interdependencies a reflection on you know the future and on how sustainability is, is a way to look at and shape the future the personal experience of natalia and how she she brings this in her operation and of course the community dimension which is of course very very important 
let's maybe start uh, the conversation uh, uh, or continue rather the conversation. I'll ask maybe Martial to set a bit the scene. The food, the agricultural agenda is becoming increasingly rapidly prominent at the COP. You know, it wasn't necessary a few years ago. Now is, you know, I would say, very central. You know, both in terms of the problem, but also very much in terms of the solution. Can you tell us about you know what the COP is about when it comes to food system, food security, uh, sustainability in the food value chain? So give us a bit the your perspective and maybe also your reflection about what's happening at COP28 and what you expect coming up in uh, in the coming months and future COPs. Okay, no, uh, I will give you a flavor on. I'm quite sure Joe will uh, will also add uh, on that. Uh, agriculture, it's a it's a recent topic in the UNFCCC, in the convention. Uh, despite the fact this is the only sector that is mentioned is the objective of the convention that is said that we we should address uh, the, the the greenhouse gas and it end by food production and it's only production angle uh, that level, but should not be put at risk. So it is in the DNA of the convention. But then. The, the convention is not, um, but it is a discussion was broad, not specific on any sector. It's only recently that you, we had a, a decision specific on agriculture, was the Coriva joint work on agriculture under the Fijian COP, uh, COP23. Now we are COP28, so you see it's only five COP. Uh, last uh, COP in Sharm el they decided to, the first part of Coronivia was, setting the scene, understanding on different topics, soil, livestock, nutrient, adaptation, basically where we are. Now they want to move on implementation. So what a COP can do to help implementing the action we need. And to update on where we are, basically, we have uh, unfortunately uh, a conclusion that is just a procedural conclusion, basically the stop the war, no agreement. And the conclusion say, let's uh, let's see you again in in session in June, and we will do better. So this is the convention of the negotiation part. It's difficult. It's difficult, but in the same time, when you manage to have something, can give you a very good signal that not only parties, countries, but all stakeholders can can use, including MDBs and so on. So I still have hope on that. It's not for now, but let's see. In June, certainly they will advance. But in the same time, you have also the COP presidencies. The COP presidencies they bring basically the flavor where they, they want to move. And we had a little bit of agriculture under the uh, Glasgow the Glasgow COP with the Glasgow breakthrough on a part on agriculture. So it was, I would say, the beginning, the infancy. Then COP27 uh, in uh, Sharm el Sheikh really put agriculture for the moment, uh, a lot of different initiatives on uh, food and agriculture for sustainable transformation, another one on related that is on ICANN, so climate action on nutrition, so it's related also, another one on water. So you see, basically, it, it uh, started really to be uh, taken seriously by a COP presidency. That COP presidency, uh, and you all know there, there is an Emirate declaration on food system. So no, there are, the lens is not only on the agriculture or different components, it's really the broad scope of the food system. It's already signed by 100, plus that 150 countries. So it shows uh, really the interest of, 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 of countries really uh, uh, interested to, to move on that agenda on food system, recognizing that it's Difficult, and the the proof is difficult. The negotiation has to. So, but basically, you you, you see, you, you you have this really movement. I guess it's an unstoppable movement now that we will have to address a uh, food system, and together with the uh, IFAD, uh, CGIR, and World uh, World Bank, we, we were really committed to support uh, the the negotiation process on the co presidency. And I will stop here because I want also to to hear Joe uh, on that. Thank you, Marcel. Before we, we move we move forward, but what what you're a veteran of uh, COP negotiations. Uh, what is the role of FAO in all of this? FAO, uh, like IFA and other, we are observers. So we are observers, but how to qualify us? Wise observer and in server observer important in the process because basically here we represent the food component of the UN. So we have the three sister organizations, uh, the room-based uh, agencies, so FAO, IFAD, and the WFP. 
And basically, this is where we also gather together all the ministers in charge of agriculture, where we have council, uh, uh, a big meeting. And so basically, we are very important helping also countries in their policies. So we are, we are observing as an observer the process, but we are trying to bring all what we have seen based on our work and uh, we know quite well where the difficulties are because we are so UN, so basically we are convening a party discussion and we are trying to bring that bridge between agriculture arena agenda with the climate change agenda. So this is our role and that's why we are also following closely equipping, I would say, the, the negotiator with the fact, information, knowledge they can use in their uh, discussion. This is why we are really engaged in that process. Thank you. Thank you, Mas. Actually, I like really to have a conversation today, right? So uh, let me go a bit off script, off, off script. So Joe, maybe if you want to explain a bit the role of IFAD in the negotiation, how you see your role and what you, you know, your organization represents in this context. Thanks, Jan Piero. So, you know, I'm going to add to what Marshall said, but um, also take a little bit of a different tack. When I first came to IFAD, um, which was in 2020, one of the first discussions that we had at my board, uh, at the IFAD board, on climate. So I was presenting a paper, a strategic discussion paper on climate. And I remember a few um, member states coming forward saying, why are we discussing climate? You're an agricultural agency. Isn't this mission drift? And now fast forward to 2023. Right? I think what we are witnessing is really a ground shift. And to be fair, not just from the COP, but also from the food and agricultural agencies, right? Recognizing that food and agriculture doesn't happen unless you think about climate. And for the climate people to realize that if you really, and these are the numbers, you know, one third of the overall emissions in the world are from food systems. But we know that at least, I know for the smallholders that we focus on, um, they're responsible for one third of the overall food as well. So if you want to think about food security, you've got to think about those people who are contributing. Uh, and in developing countries, more than 70% of the food comes from smallholders. So you've got to focus on them. So that's both the challenge and the opportunity. And the two have to come together. So I think this idea that, yeah, you're going to partition it um, and not think of it in a blended way, is, is long gone. And so what we are seeing with um, Coronivia, but then also Sharm El Sheikh, uh, the support program that we are all signatories to, um, FAO is, IFAD is, but also the Emirates Declaration, which is really bringing together this idea that food and water really have to play a very important role, both in the work that we are doing when we are thinking about mitigation, but is a key frontier when we've got to think about resilience and adaptation is really important recognition of the intertwining of these sectors. And the fact that we are is we have to take on a systems approach. So I'm going to say one more thing, which is with the World Bank, for example, we started to do what um, we started to develop what's called the financing for food systems and uh, separately also with the with FAO. We've been talking about the means of implementation, right, from the Food Systems um, Summit. And the idea is really first to define what is a food system. And I can do sort of like a quick poll of the audience here and ask you, well, can you give me a definition of what is a food system? Anyone? Anyone who will tell me what's not a food system? <laughs> So the challenge, and you know, it really, if you think about it for a second, the challenge here is that everything falls into a food system, but just really creating a boundary around it is really important. So when we started to think about the, you know, what are the needs of individual countries, and this is where IFAD comes in and plays an important role in really designing those investments on the ground so that they can speak to food system transformations on one side, but also ensure that they're speaking to the NDCs and they're speaking to the NAPs, and all of them are intertwined together. 
But when you want to decide and define, therefore, and put boundary conditions around a food system, you've got to say, this is what comes in and this is what is left out. And so when we were looking at finance flows coming into food systems, we had to define that. And so with the OECD and with the World Bank, we defined it as many sectors within, and I can give you definitions, that are within food production, within nutrition, within infrastructure, social protection, and climate. So all of that, so sub-sectors or definitions, so it's sub, sub-elements of each one of these sectors that are traditionally seen as stovepipes or separate are now coming together in the overall definition of what constitutes a food system. This is what has helped us to also dis- decide and understand what are the financial flows that are coming in, what are the needs of individual countries, and how can food system transformation pathways, NDCs, and NAVs talk to each other without being sort of the siloed approaches that we tend to do traditionally. Thank you very much. Very interesting, and I, I like the evolution of, of the uh, conversation and the and the role of IFAD in, in this context. Moving from two observers to another one, Iberdi is also an observer. <laughs> so, Natalia, I'd like to hear from you how uh, DBRD has, has really progressed in mainstreaming climate consideration in, uh, in, in our activities, you know, how you see this particularly in your area of work. I'll start with numbers. For the last 10 years, we probably uh, have invested 2.3 billion euro in 200 projects which are called green, one way or another. And only this year, we have already have 450 million euro investments which are considered green, which means pretty much 20% in one year. So you could see the acceleration. We are doing a lot to streamline the process and to push clients to promote uh, to them uh, adoption of sustainability practices. Al Dahra and Arnudis here knows very well that we are asking them a lot of questions on that plan. So what we have moved to, we are completely moving away from the use of proceeds concept. We are really moving, regardless of whether we provide capex financing, working capital, we are really moving into promotion of best sustainable practices, adoption of corporate climate governance uh, schemes, clear uh, development of clear low carbon pathways, regardless whether it's at the borrower level, now very often at the group level to make sure that the group has it and then trickle down to all subsidiaries. I'm obviously talking about larger clients, but we also increasingly looking at um, smallholder farmers and I relate very much to what Joe said in terms of coordinating efforts. We do it in various ways. We start when we work with large aggregators like Al Dahra, for example, or any other big client, um, we try to promote that they work and make their supply chain greener. We also launch supply chain financing jointly with our SME F and D team. And we have done few deals in this area. What it brings, it brings shorter payment terms to suppliers of a large aggregator, but it also done on condition that these uh, uh, suppliers implement or meet certain ESG link standards. So it's again another way of acceleration. Um, we have done a number of sustainability link loans this year. And in a broader sense, it's probably not the market type of sustainability link loan, but still, We put certain KPIs, and for that, we use increasingly blended finance, which is also helping us a lot. When we say set KPIs for scope one, two, three, and then depending on the client, water reduction, waste reduction, recycling, I mean, anything, adoption of regen practices, reduction per unit of production of whatever parameters, depending on the subsector, because food systems, and we finance the whole value chain from primary up until food retail and everything in between, including farming, logistics, packaging, production of food, beverages, anything related to food. So it is very important. Thank you, Natalia. I can sort of uh, confirm, you know, the, the complexity managing 
you know these new uh, these new approaches and how also uh, uh, though uh, uh, the entire institution is now you know moving in that direction. So we talk about the institutional perspective, the I five perspective. Let's go to the private sector. So maybe Darcy, let's start from from you. At the beginning, before you join, we talk about the multiple crises that you know the world, but particularly the, the food sector is facing. You know, I talk about the, the biodiversity crisis, nature crisis, climate change, of course, but also other disruptions linked, for example, to trade uh, issues, of course, the geopolitical situations, a pandemic only a couple of years ago. So I'm right. I'm really uh, uh, curious to know how a, a private enterprise like PepsiCo is is bringing this element in its strategic planning, how you deal with complexity, how you manage to integrate this consideration, in your risk assessment in your strategic planning. Um, well, you're absolutely right that the complexity continues to increase, right? We saw it with the pandemic, we've seen it with geopolitical tension and certainly climate now has us uh, in a situation where you know a hundred year disaster is happening every other year in terms of you know droughts or storms and the unpredictability of um, that situation um, makes us think differently right and i think the word has been mentioned a couple of times that you know really that underlying quality that we value is resilience and how do we build it in um, to our systems and you know climate itself, uh, trade shocks, these other things you talked about challenge a business like PepsiCo end to end. And so we have to sort of look end to end at what we can um, control both to adapt and to mitigate um, cl on climate and on other risks as well. And, you know, I think for many companies, not just PepsiCo, what happens in our four walls is a little bit easier to do that, right? So if you think about scope one and two emissions, we've made a lot of the changes that we need to make or we're on the path to making them. Um, it is clear that we need to, you know, move to renewable energy and operating our factories, you know, we that we need to electrify our fleet and bring down emissions related to transport. And so as we think about our operations, um, certainly insulating ourselves from shocks, looking at reducing cost and increasing resilience is more straightforward. Um, when you start thinking about scope three and all the places where we are dependent on others in our value chain who also face greater volatility, not least of which, of course, are farmers, um, thinking about how to build resilience starts with partnership. And so we really have to be able to put ourselves in the shoes of those farmers and say, what are the tools um, that we can use as PepsiCo? Who are the partners, whether that's you know banks or through policy with um, some of the organizations on stage here with me um, that can help to de-risk some of the decisions that farmers need to make um, to make them more resilient in the face of climate change? And then what can we do as a you know customer um, to encourage those activities? Can we help with financial support, with technical support, with cultural support, um, you know, with something like a demonstration farm to show how new technologies lead to better outcomes in the field, uh, with creative financing to help with the initial transition before those regenerative agri agricultural practices start to pay back. Um, can we use our agronomists? Can we partner with the knowledge of FAO, with ministries of agriculture, um, to make sure that farmers are receiving the training and the assistance that they need? Um, and so, you know, it quickly becomes clear, right, that we don't control that destiny. We have to think about the ways that we can kind of bring those um, bring those outcomes to bear. Uh, and so, we do that um, both internally and. Um, with our external partners, um, in some ways through innovation, right? You want to take a technological approach as well as that community approach um, through joint investments um, with some of the organizations here, um, but also jointly um, with partners. We work pre-competitively. In many cases, you know, our competitors, others in the food and beverage sector are facing the same thing. So we're thinking about how we can just adjust together. And then we have to remember that we know a lot of things um, that maybe other people don't. Um, we can use our power of logistics 
to help farmers gain access to things that aren't needed for our supply chain, but where, you know, we can, we can assist. Um, we have agricultural research that we do. Can we share it um, more broadly? So I think we can think about ways that we can use our, um, our knowledge, our scale, um, our, uh, what we see in what we see across different regions, for example, to compare, contrast, and share that knowledge to um, make that transition happen a little faster. Thank you very much, Darcy. I'd like to raise the same question, more or less, to, to Anu, really about how you incorporate these risks in your business planning, your investment decisions, your operational decisions. I'm particularly interested how you, you say you're an optimist, you look forward, how you move from being reactive to be proactive, to be preventive. Let me be fair, proactive on this stage and then uh, invite uh, PepsiCo to have a conversation with us as farmers. We can provide you, for instance, uh, potatoes grown through our reg uh, practices in Egypt, which we used to do in the, in the past, actually. But that partnership um, uh, fell apart because we couldn't find a long-term partnership. And I think that's where we can find each other. Um, as farmers, uh, we farm around the world in about 20 different countries. Um, but farming is never a one-year thing. It's never a three-year thing. Farming you do for 10, 20 or more years um, uh, because your investments take time. Investments in your soil, that's your best investments. That's your best friend, right? Really pay off in the long term. So if we work together with uh, customers in the value chain, we are really looking forward to, to a longer-term partnership because if we do these regenerative agricultural practices, they are beneficial to us. They are beneficial to our bottom line, but they require investments where uh, financing partners can help, but also off-takers can really help to secure us. We will buy your product at a, at, at a reasonable pricing formula for the next five or 10 years. So you can do your investors in the planters that you need. Because if you do no tillage farming, you need different planters than your regular planters. You need different harvesters. And those investments where you typically replace your machinery only once every 10 or 15 years, now you have to replace your entire fleet to do and meet the requirements of your, your customer. Happy to do that if you uh, want to go into a partnership for multi-years. And then um, actually large-scale farmers like us can help you. But if we have difficulties, like with a large-scale farming platform uh, uh, to do these investments, just imagine what the smallholders are facing to do the same, to, to find you in the market and to make the consideration, do I buy this exp expensive machinery to be more sustainable in my farming? So I think these risks we can tackle by uh, stronger, longer-term partnerships. Um, um, that would help us a lot. Thank you very much. Can, can I ask a brief, briefly another personal question? So why you are at the COP? What, you, what is your main objective, your main reason for being here? Well, I was actually uh, challenged by some of my friends on a recent trip I had, and I started talking about all the great things that I believe we're doing and said, well, if you do so many great things, why don't I know about it, right? It can't be true. Why do I believe that what you're doing is really sustainable? So, well, actually, we have no time to talk about it. We're farming. And we as a company need to shift the paradigm a bit and start talking about a lot of the good things that we're doing. For instance, um, we're starting to, we have our largest farm is in Romania, uh, 56,000 hectares of farmland. And we're doing that in, with regenerative uh, practices, uh, which could bring us carbon credits. Um, but we never bothered to go through all that administrative process that is required to do so, to, to, to get actually paid for that. We're going through that with uh, a partnership with Agrina. We signed an MOU earlier today uh, with them to get registered for all the good things that we're doing. But so far, nobody knew about it. Even we didn't get rewarded for it. While what we were doing actually makes a lot of sense. Uh, so why we're at COP28 to, to show that it can be done. There is sustainable farming. Regenerative agriculture exists in practice. It's not just a catchphrase that people love to talk about. And as, as a company, we like to talk about it because we do want to attract capital and in, in investors. We do want to talk to uh, customers that would love to find indeed the uh, low carbon uh, inputs into that process. Uh, I'm sure PepsiCo is looking for that. I saw yesterday online the CEO of Heineken asking for um, a low carbon malting barley. Uh, we can provide that to, to you. I'm not sure if you're online listening to us, but we can do that. Um, so sometimes in the value chain, it's not so easy to find each other because maybe also as a farmer, we don't talk enough about what we're doing. 
Thank you very much. Before moving to Puri, can I ask the same question to you? Why PepsiCo is at the COP? Uh, well, for many reasons, right? I mean, but I think in, in some ways, similar to what we're just expressed is we have people up and down our value chain. We have our government partners. We have civil society in one place focused on um, a similar problem. And just uh, at the panel, just before this one, uh, before I came running in, so sort of the same question and that we realized that sitting on the, um, uh, sitting up on the dais were people that lived within a pretty close radius from one another, but who hadn't met and didn't know that we were all sort of working on this issue. And so, you know, having the world focused uh, on climate and what we do through that lens, I think does create the opportunity for partnership. Um, there are those who say, you know, it will just be a talk shop. And I think the test of whether we got what we needed out of COP, right, is the number of conversations where we follow up. Uh, and we look at um, how to partner with those who are bringing other skills to the table. But that, you know, personally for me was to be listening um, to the conversations around food and ag specifically uh, to say, wait a second, who's bringing some new data? Who's bringing, you know, new technology, new perspectives that we need to be, you know, looking at, thinking about and partnering with? Thank you very much. I'm very pleased about your, your answer because, you know, uh, there are a lot of criticism about, uh, sometimes about, you know, of, you know, what it means and the impact, etc. But really, you know, being a platform for communication, a magnifier of your activities, I think there is a lot of value into that. I'd like to go back to risk and um, and involve uh, Puri in this discussion. So clearly we have big organizations that have the tools, the capacity to understand risk, to manage risk, to incorporate uh, 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 this analysis in their decision-making process, in their operation. What about the small farm holders? What are the challenges for them and what IFAD is doing to support them in this context? Thanks, Jen. Um, thank you. Uh, thanks, Jen Piero. So, um, smallholder farmers actually face slightly different, no, I mean, well, they find, uh, they, they face a different kind of risk, but I, I, I like how Arno put it as well. Challenge, and I'm an economist by training, so I've been trained to think about markets, right? Uh, we all think about markets, but the big challenge for smallholder farmers is there are uh, missing markets. So uh, we all assume in classical uh, economics theory that, yeah, you know, you need capital, you essentially go to the bank, and you should be able to get it so long as you can provide some collateral. A lot of smallholder farmers uh, and identically for labor markets, that you should have access to labor so long as you're willing to pay the price. But actually, that doesn't happen in most markets where smallholders are operating. You, uh, even if you're willing to pay the price, and this is very similar, now we are finding this also with large insurance companies, by the way. Insurance companies will definitely not go and insure certain contexts because no amount of premium is good enough for them to operate. So suddenly we are confronted uh, with this world, which neoclassical economics did not deal with uh, or think about, which is we've got missing markets across the board. We've got um, essentially risks that are magnifying this. And we've got the challenge then to think about also at the same time, um, black swan events or the unknown unknown. So things that I don't even know, I don't know. And that becomes really important if we're thinking about future fit companies and we want to come in as an agency that is truly looking after the smallholder farmers. Um, you know, Darcy spoke about conflicts. Large amounts of the world today are getting affected because of climate uncertainty, which we know evidence shows us will lead to increased intrapersonal intercommunal uh, conflict. So in this context, then smallholder farmers have missing missing markets. They have increased likelihood of being uh, exposed to conflict, and we then also have to deal with absent um, absent uh, finance. Where IFAD comes in is therefore in all three of these areas and helps to provide and create new markets, provide um, new platforms, and I can give you an example, which is the Africa Risk Climate Adaptation Financing Mechanism that we just announced this at this top, which is a $200 million platform where we are bringing in bilateral donors, 
uh, multilateral donors and the private sector with EFAD, blending these finances and then working in four countries in Africa, uh, Uganda, Tanzania, Kenya and Rwanda to then ensure that not only are we catalyzing markets that are existing, but creating new markets with green credit lines and that are truly targeting populations that are truly vulnerable as a consequence of the climate crisis. So the smallholder farmers, the people that are insecure and are likely to fall under the poverty line because very few institutions target those people. But bringing in that blended finance then also ensures that we have one other responsibility, which is benefit sharing. Not very many institutions ensure that the farmers or rural producers who are most likely to invest in these regenerative practices, agroforestry, agroecology, no-till, uh, conservation agriculture, are the ones that are also benefiting as a consequence of these investments. Benefit sharing is then the other mainstay of the investments that we design so that we can ensure that those benefits and those proceeds also go back to the farmers through the off-taker mechanisms, through uh, farmers' organizations that we work with and through uh, the indigenous people's organizations that we work with. Thank you very much, Joe. And actually, this point on benefit sharing links very well with my next question. I'd like to start with, with Darcy. I guess we all agree that in a disrupted world because of climate change, because of biodiversity losses, etc., ultimately value is destroyed. And you know, you may argue that even a commercial return may disappear altogether. So as, as a commercial entity, you know, that ultimately you, you are driven, you know, by by uh, commercial objectives. How can you combine, you know, your your commercial objective, your your driver as a as a corporate, um, and and you know the responsibility you have towards your shareholders, with ultimately the broader climate objectives, you know, the public goods that are associated to interventions that address climate change. Uh, well, in many ways, it's not um, an option for us to combine, right? We are seeing. Um, uh, regulation um, from the CSRD, from uh, the Securities and Exchange Commission, right? Our investors want to know about that risk that we face from climate and from, you know, environmental pressures and sustainability, and they want to understand how we're factoring it into our value chain. Um, you know, we're a food and beverage company, which means reliable supply of food is absolutely necessary for our bottom line. And, you know, as I noted before, that reliability is is being significantly challenged. And so the definition of value for us, I think, has changed. And so we want um, reliable partners. We want to know that our farmers are making investments that will mean they can consistently supply us with high quality, you know, potatoes or corn or wheat or other inputs um, and have made the, the investments in many ways through partnership, right, to be able to do so. Um, it's it's a wise investment in our own resilience to do that. Um, some of Joe's comments earlier, and this maybe is a slightly indirect um, reference uh, to your question, but I think we do as business also have a responsibility to create value and create choice among the supply chain. Um, and before I joined PepsiCo, I spent a number of years as an agricultural trade negotiator. And my job was to open markets for U.S. agricultural products. And if I did my job right, then a U.S. farmer would have more options to sell her products across the world to more countries, in more forms, under more circumstances, and so more opportunities to create value and to use the resources they have um, on their farm to, you know, figure out what, what combination would be most valuable for them. In many ways, um, the regenerative agriculture tasks business with a similar choice, right? Which is how can we think about encouraging practices that will create more resiliency and more consistency of supply, but do it in a way that also drives farmer options. And again, that may require working with and partnering with folks at this, you know, on this stage, um, with our competitors, with other partners to say, are we measuring value and success and the outcomes of those regenerative practices in the same way? 
are we recognizing each other's programs that we've set up so that we don't make farmers choose between if they do these practices, they can sell to us, but not somebody else. Um, so, you know, again, thinking about the scale that a, a company like PepsiCo has, um, thinking about the frameworks that FAO and others set up to help, you know, look at what are the benefits of certain practices and making sure those are interoperable um, and implemented in a way that drives farmer options and choice, not just look specifically at my supply chain, um, but at all the crops that farmers might might grow and how they can maximize value of those things. Super. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, you mentioned two words that actually are actually quite interesting and link well with Arno. You talk about choices, you talk about responsibility. So what are the choices that a business operation like yours can make? You know, what are what it means responsibility in the context again, responsibility versus your shareholder investors, but also vis-a-vis -vis the, the the value that you want to create as a as an organization, how you can combine the business objectives with the broader uh, uh, sort of a responsibility that we have as individuals but also as organizations. No, farming is about uh, every day making choices what you do with your with your land. And uh, fortunately, a lot of the choices that we make, sustainability choices, are also good for the bottom line. Uh, we would love to get further support to do so because you can do them faster. A, a few examples. In Romania, where the majority of our land is fully integrated, uh, irrigated, um, the yields on those lands uh, could be three times higher than the pieces of land that are not irrigated yet, that, have to, that are rain-fed. Um, and the practices that we have by uh, precise agriculture and making sure we don't apply more than the, the, the soils need uh, mean that we can do it at a lower cost. But the, if you imagine the neighboring farm that may not have irrigation and may not have those best practices, getting yields that are three times or more uh, less than than uh, than what we get on the on the best practice farming. So what we want to do is bring our best practices to more land. That's why uh, we want to double our land bank so we can do more with less. Um, we want to have, bring those best practices from one country to another where we where we operate. And those choices we believe are our best contribution to sustainability, because we will need less farmland to feed more people. And if we indeed will have 25% more people in 25 years from now, uh, let's hope we can do it not with 25% more farmland, because that would impact uh, nature resources or other things we want to do with the land uh, that we would claim for uh, agriculture. So I believe uh, on the day-to-day -day choice that we make in investments, in farming practices, but also financial investments, because all these things that we, we love to do will cost money. So going from flood irrigation, which is highly inefficient water usage, uh, to uh, irrigation or pivot irrigation or pivot irrigation with dragon lines or drip irrigation or sub, uh, soil drip irrigation can save you 97% of water usage. And in areas like in Arizona, California, where we farm, that makes a, a lot of sense. That's not a lot of water. The, the the land is expensive, so saving that makes a lot of uh, sense. But it requires a lot of investments to do so. So um, there's a lot of choices to make along the way to be as sustainable as you can. There is a, uh, a, a big payoff uh, from that. Um, but those investment choices uh, we need to make every day would be helped by partnerships with financial partners, with governments that are supporting us with these practices and with off-takers. So we can make those day-to-day -day choices now for with, with a payoff in the future. Thank you so much. Can I stay on this topic of choices, maybe bringing back uh, Joe into this discussion? You know, we look at small, oldest farmers as rule takers, standard taker. We think that perhaps they don't have choices, but what, what do you think actually Small older farmers can can bring to the table in terms of best practice, in terms of experience. Do they have something to share, even with large organizations that are setting examples of best practice? Okay, uh, thank you, uh, thank you. So, uh, smallholder farmers actually, uh, we did an evidence review um, last year. And I was one of the co-authors with my colleagues, and we wanted to understand, you know, where is it that we know that smallholder farmers are doing quite well and where we don't have evidence. So which doesn't mean the absence of evidence is not the evidence of absence. So that's really important, right? Uh, but uh, so 
where did we find that there was evidence that yes, smallholder farmers are far, is a superior farming method? One, we know that smallholder farmers tend to be far more diverse and adopt agrobiodiverse and agroforestry and agroecological practices compared to large monocultural farms. Um, the evidence is very good out there, and um, they do it primarily because there is an incentive for them to invest in soil health, and they don't have the kind of monetary power that they can, uh, that they you need to have to go and get fertilizers, etc. And so they are, tend to be far more biodiverse on their plots of land. The second piece of evidence that we found was that smallholder farmers are also likely to be far more efficient with respect to land. So not with respect to labor, right? There is a marginal product of labor and there's a marginal product of land. With respect to land, they are far more efficient uh, compared compared to most other farming types, and this is also um, primarily um, given to us by the evidence. We brought this out in the you know, previous rural development report, uh, they occupy 11% of the overall land area, but uh, they produce, depending on which continent, at least amongst developing countries, 70% of the food. So they tend to be far more efficient. We also know, so, but where uh, smallholder farmers we know, um, we don't know the evidence very well on, is in terms of global supply chains and vulnerability. So the challenge for us is, so on one side, when supply chains are local and um, are local and localized, we know that smallholder farmers, when they are tapping into local markets, tend to be far more resilient than those that are subjected to global supply chains, which is not to say that we should only be local. The pendulum has swung too far for us to um, to not recognize the comparative advantage of what global trade also ensures, but really to recognize that if we are wanting to ensure increased resilience, smallholder farmers can be far more resilient than uh, those that are tapping into larger supply chains. And then the fourth point is that when we look at our own evidence, so we've looked at our seven and a half billion dollar portfolio, just ended in 2021, and we found that smallholder farmers are also able to make their communities far more resilient, are able to access markets, uh, local markets uh, with far greater efficiency uh, when they're provided with infrastructure and are able, the marginal return from investment in infrastructure is far greater. You know? So it's really important that there, uh, to recognize that there are investment opportunities to be had with smallholder farmers. But I do want to say that where I think the jury's still out and where we still want to see as to what kind of evidence exists is in the context of carbon markets, in the context of aggregation economies. Most markets, most investors, especially large investors, want to come in when there are aggregation economies and economies of scale. And there we do require organizations, PepsiCo, uh, yourself, uh, to then help create essentially those platforms where large off-takers can come and play and provide the options for aggregation for economies of scale. Thank you very much, Joe. Marcel, can I bring you back in the discussion? Yes. So we have heard the, the, the story of large corporates. We heard the experience of smallholder farmers. So can we go back to the title of this of this event? So how do you see the role of the private sector? You know, are you are you convinced that we are on the right trajectory or there are something that is really missing? How to start? Um, perhaps just a reflection why we are all here today farmers, private sector, UN agencies, because we have to recognize that transformation, transformation of agriculture of that sector is not an option. This is clear. This is what IPCC is saying. If we are not using all the sectors, including agriculture, we will fail to go to 1.5 degree target, zero hunger target, agenda 2030. So I guess we have no option just to be talking to each other to find the solution. So uh, a lot of you, and you were mentioning that for farmers, it's a choice. It's also a choice for MDBs, 
because you don't want to have investment that are basically not going the right direction. It's also a choice for private sector. They have to decide on where to, to, uh, to invest and to be sure that they are, their model is sustainable, economically sustainable. But basically, this is why we are all here today. Uh, so on that, I'm optimist because it's a, finally a good movement that we, we really need to break the cycle. At the same time, we know it's not simple. It's simple to put around the table, UN agencies, farmers, private sectors. So we need to find the, the mechanism to do that. Uh, we have different ways. We have different forums already existing. We have the Committee of Food Security, for instance, where we have parties, countries. We have also the private sector mechanism that is there, that is also bring uh, his voice. We have observers, we have farmers. Uh, but I guess we need more of those space to ensure that all together we find the right solutions. There is not only one solution, there are plenty of solutions, solutions as con country specific, farm specific also. It's not the same for your farm, the farm of your neighbor even, or the farm in another country. But we, we know basically we have, the vision is there. We know what is the vision. We, what we want is to, to have a, uh, and back to your first question of sustainability on my personal answer, what I want is for my daughter and my son to have a life in a planet that will be sustainable. So this is what I want. So I guess we are all sharing that that vision. So no how to 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 to, to unit and to act together. Uh, basically, we have to recognize all what we are doing to pull all this in the equation and try to find agreement where how on where we can move together. For that we need tools. Tools to take decision to minimize all different risks. It can be a, a reputational risk for an agency, it can be an economic risk for a private sector, it can be a, a risk for uh, basically all your business, your farm. Uh, so we are all coping with the risk. For this, we need tools. So perspective tools to understand exactly to take the good decision. So tool to put having an idea. If I do an action, or if I implement a policy, or we have invest in a project, I'm going the right direction. So we need to invest in that tools to minimize the risk. So tool to assess risk. Tool to assess greenhouse gas impact. Tool to assess biodiversity impact. And we need to look at the synergies on trade-off. There are some trade-off. It's not all synergies. We we need to minimize trade-off. So for instance, I can provide the name of a tool. One is uh, together with IFA, the ABC map. So we are trying to, to look at, at the same time, adaptation, biodiversity on carbon, so greenhouse gas, all together on, then after it's to the people to decide. But basically you, you have the, the most complete picture. It's not enough. We have to add on that the risk. You have to add on that the socio, social aspect also because it will have an impact on people. So we need to need we need to have tools and to find the the, the best way. We need places to discuss. Uh, I was late uh, uh, because I, we were launched having the inception meeting of the fast partnership if that is part uh, where it's basically a, a partnership that we want to exchange on three pillars finance, and this is uh, quality and quantity. So it's not only the quantity of finance, also the quality of finance. Finance that right that will reach the right people. So this is exactly what we want. Policy, because even if if you if you want to have a sector that is really uh, attractive, you need also to have policies that help that turn this possible. If you are a country and you reach out the green climate fund saying, I want a hundred million or several or oh, you uh, EBRD and saying, I want to invest hundred million in, in that subsector. You will analyze the policy of the country. And if you realize that there is nothing as a backup, you will say, mm, my risk is perhaps is too high. So we need to work all together on the finance, the policy sector on the third pillar that we should not forget it's data information, knowledge, capacity building. Because also we cannot do or develop the right policy if we don't have the data we need. So we need to also to track and to be sure that then when we take action, when we decide based on the 
multi-criteria analysis that we are also able to track our progress. So this is the three pillars uh, that we have to address. Climate, policy, data, knowledge, capacity building, and based on not only one actor, all the actors together to find the, the best, let's say, tools we can develop together for the best action we can implement. So, thank you. Thank you, Marcel. I'd like to close with, with Natalia. You heard a lot of interesting inputs. Uh, your portfolio is virtually 100% you know, private sector focused. So what, what you're doing to, uh, 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 let's say, reflect these considerations and this need from the private sector in, in the products that DBRD can offer, and also how you, you think you need to do to remain, for DBRD to remain relevant in supporting this transition? I'll start with the last thing that Marcel said. We all know that food systems are very complex. To reflect this complexity, we really need a lot of trade-offs on the way. And I like the phrase to minimize the trade-offs, because in the end, sustainability involves uh, economic, environmental, and social sustainability. If you imagine a triangle, you cannot make it like this, right? So it has to be balanced. And I think our role as a financial, international financial institution is to balance competing needs, taking into account desire of private clients, government, countries, but always taking into account because whatever we are talking about uh, in developed countries, for example, a lot of things that Darcy was saying, and a lot of things that Joe was saying about developing countries are very much relevant, but very much different. They're not the same. So you will always, whatever is super innovation in tiny Tajikistan will never be an innovation in Poland or US. So you have to also balance these approaches, right? And I think that our role as an international financial institution is crucial in bringing everyone together because we work with small farmers. We do deals like half a million easily, not a problem. We do deals like 150 million, working with aggregators who then work with their supply chain. And we are also providing advisory and technical assistance to this uh, thing. We work with FAO a lot. We cooperate, I don't even remember, for 28 years, doing a lot at supply chain level, at policy level, at country level. Uh, at climate change level, you may remember Jean Piero, we launched at COP26 in Glasgow a joint report on decarbonization of the agri food sector. And we called it, uh, is it utopia or the new green wave? And there were certain actions identified. I also wanted to reflect uh, a bit on what Arnaud said about future growth. This year, we launched a competition for startups jointly with our SME uh, team who also has a venture program. We received 100 applications from our countries of operations, funnily enough, a lot from North Africa, for example. We didn't expect that way less from Central Eastern Europe. We selected the winners, and earlier this week, there was Agritech uh, Innovation Summit where we presented our winners. We promoted them. Some of them already managed to raise money. And we are only talking about very concentrated geography. We are not like IFC global coverage, right? We have more concentrated geography, but still we are doing quite a lot. And then talking a bit more on government relationship, I know that your team, Jean Piero, is working a lot with governments on certain pilots or sets of pilots for them to deliver on nationally determined contributions. So we are covering client level, uh, government level, and anything in between, because we are also working again with power a lot with various industry associations, with universities to bring the voice of the private sector, for example, in development of particular curricula that is needed, say for potato grow growth and modern farming practices, precision agriculture. I'll stop here. I think I <laughs> thank you thank you very much natalia we are kind of almost almost there you know we are only a few minutes so allow me to ask you a very quick question to to close this, this panel thank you because you provided really very insightful 
comments and observations. The question is, what you learned so far at the COP that you will bring home and you will reflect upon and use in your own activity and perhaps even your personal life? Uh, so I think for me, uh, COP and fora like this just help me connect the dots a bit more, right? We see what, what FAO is learning on the roadmap, for example. What are policy strategies to help keep agricultural production in 1.5 without sacrificing productivity? How do I use that, right? How do I fit into those, those policy frameworks? So for me, it's really, I think, connecting the dots and then um, personally taking what I learned and asking myself then, where is PepsiCo uniquely suited to bring interesting skills to the table, um, reminding myself, you know, what are ways we can drive um, value and choice uh, for others in our supply chain? Thank you, Marcial. Uh, I, I wanted to say exactly the same. So uh, yeah, I, I was so surprised. No, connectivity for sure. We, we need to connect, and we are here uh, basically to, to connect each other. So, but to, to add on that, it's and perhaps it's also the feeling of that. Of it's nothing is simple complexity and we have to address the complexity but it's not because it's complex because sometimes we fail like the agriculture negotiator or basically we postpone that we should uh, abandon uh, we keep, so we, we need really to keep eye or, or willingness to move because I, I will repeat myself myself we have no choice so basically we need to address that complexity on all together only all together we can do that no, thank you. Joe. Thanks, Jean Piero. So I would say um I, I would say on one side rec the recognition that there's a whole lot more innovation um that we can bring to bear on a problem that is as wicked as the one that we are facing today, uh, which is an excess of climate food water and agriculture. But on the other side, I think what is required for this to truly be transformational uh, in the in the way that Marshall respond um, talked about it, we require a whole lot of other things to come together, and that's essentially the nexus of uh, the blend of financing sources, the building of bankable projects, and a commitment to benefit sharing. Super, Arnum. No, no, what I take away is that there's a lot of people are busy working hard in their own field on sustainable practices, agricultural practices, banking practices, um, and that we need to find each other because a lot is being done. And if we do it together, we probably be faster achieving our goals. Fantastic. Natalia. Um, I think we need to talk more in this type of Seeing that the lesson learned to feel the pulse because everyone can share a lot. And even short calls would be very beneficial just to chat, touch base, not necessarily at COP. To me, I wanted to go back also a bit to digital and data sharing and everything, and also smallholder farmers, because at this AgriTech Innovation Summit, we met companies, amazing solutions reached out, I don't know, in finance input providing to 100,000 farmers, insurance startups, these are startups at seed basis, pretty much, not even Series A, who already provided insurance to 6 million farmers. So there is plenty there how to link and bring everyone together. We need to think and plan and do more in that respect, I think. Thank you, Natalia, Arnaud, Joe, Marcial. And Darcy, I learned a lot from this conversation, in fact. So thank you so much for uh, sharing your experience, your uh, vision, and your aspirations with us today. Thank you very much from the audience here in the room, but also, of course, connected offline. Thank you very much.